I want to welcome you today. A few safety and security rules. Uh, first of all, in the conference center, which encompasses this conference room, the restrooms, and the other small conference rooms over here, you are okay to be in. You cannot go, I've got two sets of double doors that go into my main building. Please do not go past those double doors. Uh, in the event of an emergency, for example, the fire alarm goes off, assume the building's on fire and move to the nearest exit. Um, move away from the building and we'll get things sorted out and get you back in here. Hopefully we won't have any problems with that. Of course, the weather is beautiful today, so we won't have any problems with weathers. Our medical emergencies. If we have anybody that has any medical problems, I want you to contact my front desk. Um, and we have several Dynetics people in the room. Would my Dynetics people raise their hands for me? All right. See, I got a whole bunch of people. You just tell them that you have a medical emergency. They'll call the front desk, and we'll get an ambulance rolling over here. Okay. Uh, I have two foreign nationals. Would my two foreign nationals raise their hand for me? There's one. Where's my second one? And he's over there. So just be aware, uh, a Dynex person, be aware of the, my two foreign nationals. Otherwise, if I have no questions, thank you. Have a great conference. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate everyone coming out today for our uh, security B-Sides Huntsville. I'm Paul Coggin. I'm one of the, the organizers for the event today. And uh, if you need anything, I'll work for Dianetics so I can help you out with anything that may pop up today. If you got any questions, uh, need any help. So today we've got two tracks. This is track one in the main conference room. Down the hall, at the far end of the hall, is the west conference room where track two is located. And in between track one and track two conference rooms, there is a lockpick village if you're interested in lockpicking that uh, Adrian Crenshaw, the Iron Geek, has provided for us if you'd like to learn about and practice lockpicking. So, and, uh, so next, it's going to be a great pleasure of mine to introduce one of my closest friends in the industry, Mr. Robert M. Lee. He's one of Alabama's own, very proud to say. Not only a good friend of mine, but he's from uh, the great state of Alabama. He's from Coleman, where he was born and raised. And uh, he is a Air Force Cyber Warfare Officer. He's a PhD candidate. He's a co-founder of Drago Security. He's a SANS instructor. He's a, a course developer for SANS. Teaches critical infrastructure, SCADA, threat intelligence. Uh, he's a college professor. And he's the author of a book on SCADA, SCADA and Me. And he does a lot of other things. I mean, the guy's got so much, gets so much energy. I don't know how he gets so many things done. But he's one of what he is one of the true thought leaders. You know, thought leader is a really abused term these days. If you go out and Google Robert, Robert is one of the true thought leaders in critical infrastructure security and threat intelligence. He's constantly blogging, getting picked up by all the big names in the industry. And, uh, and quoted and recognized. It's, we're very, very honored to have Robert here today. Y'all please help me welcome him. And let's get ready to learn a lot more. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right, perfect. So that's really kind uh, uh, introduction here. I know as a keynote, I really just have two jobs. One is to wax poetically about security, and the second is to run over my time slot into the first section. Um, I will try to accomplish both, but I wanted to change it up a little bit instead of just saying security is cool, to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart and something that I think goes very well with the idea of B-sides, and that is thinking past the problem, maybe a little bit of strategy, and how to learn and develop ourselves. So uh, what I want to introduce today, and this is the first time publicly, is the active cyber defense cycle, something I've been working on for a while. Um, I have like a little about me. The only piece that I really wanted to focus on was the skate in me. It's a little children's book, which is the background for the slides that you see today. I found that it was incredibly effective to my leadership in the military to uh, write things in children book format to explain SCADA as it is a kind of a complex topic. Uh, at first, I did so sort of frustratedly and uh, a little bit of uh, vent uh, venting doing that, but then they actually liked it, and I had to little eat a you know a little humble pie and uh, keep making them. So. At this point, I want to talk a little bit about history, because we, we generally don't think of history too much when we're talking about security. It's all about the, the zero days and what we're doing. But uh, 
especially as an Air Force officer, right? And let me start off by saying my views do not represent the Air Force, the Department of Defense, or anybody else besides my own. My little private statement I gotta gotta use. Um, to me, one of the the cool strategies, uh, the strategist in the Air Force was John Boyd. Uh, there's probably a couple of you that that rings a bell. For those of you that don't, maybe you've heard of him as the OODA loop guy. So he's the guy that came up with the OODA loop. So before Boyd, if you were a fighter pilot, you either had it or you didn't. You were cocky, which that never changed. Um, but you were most certainly all about stick feel. There was no strategy. There was no science or art, anything in planes. You either killed the other guy or you got killed. If, if you had to ask who the best fighter pilot in the world was, it wasn't you. And that was the mantra. And so John Boyd came around and fighting the Korea War and said, you know, this is silly. Uh, we've got to be able to look at all these case studies that we have. We have to be able to look at all the different uh, interactions that we've had with the enemy and find some sort of pattern. And we've got to see what we can learn from those case studies to how to train and do better for the next fight. And so that's what he really did. That's the patterns of conflict, the OODA loop. Um, that was his aerial attack study. And it revolutionized fighter tactics around the world. Um, so that was an, an ongoing, non-static strategy he had. So in our field, I feel that sometimes we forget the strategy. We forget the purpose. We generally think of defense as this binary thing. Like, I either have defense or I don't. If they breach my firewall, I lost. Well, if the enemy didn't get what they wanted and you didn't lose what you wanted, did defense really fail? And so we have to start having a more mature discussion around security rather than, oh, I saw the security logs. I've got to tell my management I suck at defense. Uh, another aspect that I generally see in the community is we are we're very quick to buy into these myths. You know, the advanced persistent threats are oh gosh, they're so advanced, and you know, Sony didn't get hacked because they weren't doing security. They got it because the adversary was just so advanced. You know, don't fire me. It's not that we weren't doing security. It's the adversary is so good. The hacker's always going to get through. And I feel that's kind of a a belittling mindset to people actually doing security. Actually, defense is very doable. When you look at kill change, and you look at what the adversary has to learn about you to even start their operation, and you look at what defenders have available to them in terms of network knowledge, defenders actually have an upper hand. And I know that makes a lot of security personnel cringe when I say that. Defenders have an upper hand. We just have problems in the industry, one of which is training the people to do it. Another is empowering them. You know, How do you get your management, how do you get your leadership to buy into the idea that you can make network configuration changes to increase security? You know, does your CISO sit on the board level or do they report to the CIO where the CIO's job is five nines? You know, you got to keep the network running no matter what. So if you have those internal conflicts, we buy into these myths that, well, traditional defense fails. To me, the only part about traditional defense failing is that traditionally we don't do defense. Um, but talented individuals on these teams, very, very impressive security professionals throughout the industry, even us, like, who really, really are passionate about it, We'll get focused entirely on our process, not what do we do to affect the mission of the organization, not what do we do to help out, but, oh, look at this piece of malware. I analyzed it to the best of my ability, and it's just awesome. Um, but there's, there's an ability to learn from our engagements and get better over time. So what is this term active defense? Well, historically, when we talk about active defense, almost everybody who's heard the term in this room probably thinks strike back, you know, hack back. That's entirely inaccurate. And the reason we have this myth about active defense is because those that have been writing about, uh, in academia, writing about active defense have traditionally been academics and lawyers. If you go look through uh, the publications, which I've, uh, as pursuing a PhD, you, you learn to love to read, um, and especially for a Coleman, Alabama kid, uh, that can be hard sometimes. But I try my best, and I read through all these lawyer documents, and I find that, um, you know, head of law at Harvard and Yale, very informed people, but then they take someone like Mao, the Chinese Communist Party leader, they take his theories on active defense and they just copy and paste into cyber. Because, well, heck, it's got to be the same. But that fails the actual purpose. And so when you look at what Mao was trying to do, for instance, in the Second Sino-Japanese War, he was pushing out the adversary, right? He understood his environment, he understood his territory, and he was doing the People's War, or the Death by a Thousand Cuts, you probably heard that, right? So the guerrilla warfare tactics of, Choosing the battlefield, instead of having this passive defense, which he hated, which was all about lining up and then shooting the other guys, he realized that he was going to die if he did that, because he didn't have the troops, he didn't have the tech. You know? So the Japanese strongly overpowered his people, no way to do that. So he chose his battles, and he believed in a mobile force to do that. Same thing we have with the active and air missile defense. 
So that was all about taking down the nukes and missiles before they strike our territory, because no amount of passive defensive could help us there. But the, again, the idea wasn't really like, I'm going to bomb them beforehand, or I'm going to bomb them while they shoot the missile. It was, I'm going after the capability, that missile before it strikes me, since I can't defend against it appropriately. So it's about counter-striking that capability. And the third piece uh, for my Army guys in the room is General Deploy, 1976, published a very radical uh, doctrine in the Army, uh, Field Manual 100-5 Operation, talking about active defense and ultimately how to keep a mobile force behind lines that he could shift whenever the enemy uh, pushed through the lines. Because he had the understanding that the Soviets had better technology than the military was ready to invest in post-Vietnam. And so that's what he did. And don't worry, I'll move away from doctrine here in a second and talk a little more about cyber stuff. But I think it's important to understand other fields of study instead of just being focused on our security process. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, so when you look at active defense purpose, rather than the hack back, strike back, you know, media jargon, one of the things that we see about the purpose was being mobile. It was about being able to identify where the adversary was, what their capability was, learning from them, and being able to go back and choose the battlefield. To say, you know what, if it's not advantageous to me to put all my defenses on the firewalls and the border of the security of the network, maybe I'm going to figure out where it's advantageous for me to move around and do security when I want to, when it affects my mission and how I can do it effectively. And so that's what we see. So when we're talking about cyber defense, another little pet peeve I have, especially in the Air Force, is we generally only talk about it as defense, offense, and sometimes we throw in intel. But those guys down, you know, the hall and intel, we just leave them alone because they're kind of weird, right? Well, we never really think about past that. And so it's either defense has or defense doesn't. But truly, there's categories of defense when you look at it. To me, just for conceptual framework, not trying to say that this is the only way to do it, but when you analyze case studies, you want to do it with a framework. I broke it out into architecture, passive defense, uh, active defense, intel, and offense. And so that's kind of weird. How does intel and offense contribute? Well, especially at national policy level and being able to strike back in the face, you know, NATO Article 5 kind of stuff, defense of the, the total. That matters to be able to do offense for defense purpose. But if you look, and most of us kind of know this already, if you look at the resources invested by companies or resources invested by the government, uh, it's on the right side of the scale, right? Or right side of the scale for y'all. Right side of the scale is all about offense. And so you see like Admiral Rogers, for instance, coming out at GridSecCon, talking to those who do critical infrastructure for the power grid and saying, if you want to do defense, we've got to invest in offensive capabilities to strike back to the adversary, because if we don't, then they will take down the power grid. But that's not his fault. To me, that's our fault. We've told our national level leaders, our sea level leaders, for years that defense isn't doable, that tactical defense fails, that we just can't do it. So they're going to look for these other means of doing business. And so they've invested resources on the offense and intel side of the house, because that's what we basically told them to do. And so that's the same thing with the shiny object syndrome. For anybody who's a security practitioner in here, threat intel, fusion analytics, I mean, all these things are going to be shiny objects because, well, traditional defense fails. What's the next big thing so we can do it? You know, back when the firewall was the only thing, and then IDS was the only thing, and then now threat intel is the only thing, and the cloud. You know, we have this shiny object syndrome. But when you look at all of our problems, they generally are on the left side of the scale. Bad architecting of a network, not having any patches. Uh, not doing any sort of monitoring on the network and being able to have actual collection of packet capture and these things. We see after that when uh, passive defenses, if you've returned all of your value for architecture that you can, you've, you're not going to get 100% patch ratio, but you come up to that return on investment, that's when you could go to passive defense and use the firewall and use IDSs and IPSs and these things effectively. And despite what the vendor speak might be, there is no active defense box. There is no threat intelligence box. You know, threat intelligence, for instance, is created by analysts, not tools. Uh, same thing here with passive defenses. So we do see some vendors saying, you know, this ability on the network to instantly integrate intelligence and then block things is an active defense. Now, it's, it's still a passive defense. You walk away at the end of the night and it still works. But it's still important. And so we start focusing there. So that brings me to active defense in our domain. And so when I think of active defense, I simply think of that which involves the analyst. When you're taking an active role in your defense, that's what it means. And again, some of the, the jargon in the domain is hack back. I don't see how putting the word cyber in front of something means the opposite of which. So we're still going to do defense. So what's this strategy? Well, uh, one quick slide that I want to throw up is sort of like the influences. Um, 
I want to note that there's nothing really about any of these components that I've created. Um, luckily for everybody, <laughs> I didn't uh, you know, invent network security monitoring those things. Like Richard Baitlick and all these kind of people got together over time analyzing the problem sets and creating cool aspects of defense. Um, for me, it was just about observations. So I worked in the intelligence community. I worked in uh, Air Force community. I've been able to step foot in academia and training and private sector and just view these different case studies and perspectives and culture and think about over time where do these case studies line up and when what can we make out of it? Where does defense actually succeed? Where does defense fail? Um, and we've had great luck with this actually working in the ICS and SCADA community. We put this to the test and we found that since ICS and SCADA networks or critical infrastructure tend to be more static, you know, you'll have like 12 computers on a, a power substation rather than 30,000 on an enterprise network. They're much easier to monitor, much easier to see, much easier to maintain. And defense is much more doable in those environments, even though we traditionally hear, you know, ICS is 10 years behind security. That's normally a mindset issue, not an actuality issue. So after like a 30-minute lead-in or something, here's the actual active defense cycle. Not that impressive, I get you, but it's important, and it works. Um, or at least I think so, right? I'm kind of biased since I put it together. But ultimately, I think it uh, revolves into four key components. All right, first of which is asset identification network security monitoring. If you don't know your network, there's no way to defend it. And so, again, if you look at kill chains, the adversary's first part is to do information gathering. Then they're going to do reconnaissance. They're going to learn what you have. If you already know that, you're two steps ahead of them. All right, so it's not saying that security is easy by any stretch of the imagination. It's just saying it's doable. So the people that are going throughout the network and looking and surveilling and trying to find the places to do network security monitoring, I think are probably in the best uh, position to actually identify changes to the architecture. So architecture maps uh, and understanding all that definitely is on that left side of the scale architecture. But those changes over time, network security monitoring analysts are really good at, at figuring that out. And if you don't understand these terms, don't worry, I've got more slides <laughs> and we'll talk about them. But at a high level, uh, instant response then, so once your network security monitoring analysts say something's bad on the network and it has risen to the level that is a threat, so not just a piece of malware that we freak out about, but actually something that's going to impact the organization, that's when instant response kicks off. And so the instant responders go and they go choose that tactical level defense that we're talking about. They choose where to fight and they go and they start doing our normal NIST model, maybe, you know, preparing, identifying and containing and eradicating that threat. Ultimately, that's going to pass off in the threat environment, uh, environment manipulation folks. And that's all about being able to interact with the threat. I don't say malware analysis because sometimes the threat isn't malware. Uh, there was a German steel attack uh, earlier this year, where, or, excuse me, 2014, when there was a person that uh, sent a spear phishing email to a, a uh, business network of a steel facility in Germany. And once they had access to that network, they actively moved into the internal network. There was no malware involved at the lower levels uh, that we know of. They moved into the internal network, and because they understood the process, because they understood the network and understood the steel facility's operations, was able to destroy physical components in that facility. Steel, burning, everything cracking, all the things that you can imagine. And this was actually confirmed and put out by uh, the German government and said, you know what, we had an attack that resulted uh, on actual physical destruction and luckily it didn't kill anybody. So that's the second time in history we've had a confirmed physical attack from anything cyber. That's important and that wasn't malware related on the, on the back end. So to me, it's important not to just say malware analysis. It's important to understand what is your threat and how do you interact with that. The environment manipulation aspect comes from the fact that we own the topologies. And I'll talk about this again a little more later, but it's all about the fact that no other place in history have we been able to choose our domain and manipulate it and then complain that the defender uh, is always having the hardest time. So uh, threat intelligence consumption, that's kind of like that buzzword, right? I focus on the consumption aspect because there is a difference in doing intel and creating threat intelligence and going through a real process and in intelligence lifecycle, JP2-0, that kind of stuff. And the difference in knowing how to look at your operational environment and look at that intel and match up the two to make sure that you're doing threat intelligence for the purpose of your own organization's defense. So that actually jumps us right into the number one uh, thing, which is threat intelligence consumption. What's the number one issue we always hear with threat intelligence? Well, how do I use this stuff? You know, we'll get on the C-level board. I've seen CISOs invest $20 million in, in threat intelligence programs within their company. And you start sitting down, you're like, so where's your network diagram? They're like, what? No, we've got threat intelligence. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But the other issue is we see all these data feeds and these products and all these vendors that have 
$450,000 a year licenses to get threat intelligence. And then they just shove data feeds and they say, here's all these digital hashes and malware samples and things, and that's threat intel. Well, generally it's not. But the worst part isn't the vendor. The vendor's not doing anything malicious. It's the aspect that unless you know what your organization needs, you don't know what intelligence you need. A good example, actually, and I, my classmates from, from uh, yesterday are probably bored out of their mind because I went on this spiel yesterday. Um, but in the industry, one of the things that I saw that was sort of shocking is a, a German uh, organization I was working with went out and after the Heartbleed vulnerability came out, open SSL vulnerability, it was a, kind of a big deal, they were freaking out. They said, oh my gosh, we got all this threat intel that was telling us that open SSL is vulnerable and we have Heartbleed everywhere and it's going to affect us and our private keys are going to be stolen and we are just hosed as an organization. And so they kicked immediately off an instant response. It cost them a serious amount of money to go through their organization and find out they didn't have that version of OpenSSL. They weren't vulnerable. It was never a threat. And so they spent a lot of money worrying about threat intel on something that didn't match their operational environment. And so to me, again, that threat intelligence consumption, especially within the confounds of active defense, is about being able to link up with those other teams to figure out ahead of time what do I actually need, being able to go out and choose the right data sources, the right intelligence, and being able to match that with what the organization's mission actually is. <laughs> that next piece of network security monitoring, this is the one that it kind of is a buzz term until people start using it and then it's actually really useful. Um, you can call it a number of things. These are just the terms that I chose for PowerPoint. Um, but network security monitoring, the whole understanding of this is collect, detect, and analyze. So. Where on, the, uh, where on the network can I find data that's useful to me? Full packet capture, log, syslog, uh, Windows alerts, uh, firewall alerts, all these kind of these systems and things that give me data, maybe primarily on passive defense systems that give me data. How do I look through that data and find something malicious? Is it a static signature I'm using? Is it heuristics? Is it analytics? You know, how do I ultimately come to that decision that I found something? And when I find it, how do I analyze it uh, to actually go through, and uh, I believe I put alert on there, which is a typo, I'm sorry, it's, it's analyzed. When I go through and I, I determine that these threats, these positives that I'm getting are either false positives or true positives. Is it a real threat or did it just meet my signature threshold? And so when you finally figure out that it is a real threat to the organization, it escalates up to decision makers and they say, yeah, we're going to do instant response now. And so that's that next step. <laughs> Ultimately, instant response, this is pretty pretty standard, right? We all kind of understand instant response, uh, the NIST model and going through the different stages of preparation, identification, eradication, all that. Uh, one of the things that I often find with models is that everyone finds and, and focuses on the model and not the purpose. So in instant response, my one critique of a lot of the instant response teams I work with is don't worry about what the next step is immediately. Worry about what the purpose of the steps are and then get there. For, for, uh, for just a, a quick example, in the industrial control system community, it's not uncommon to let there be malware. So if you get infected with something on a substation, most IT people would instantly like, oh, we gotta go to the NIST model, the next thing is eradicate, we gotta focus on this, and like, hold on. What is the mission? The mission in ICS, industrial control systems, is to keep the operations running. Power goes off, that's bad. Water goes off, that's bad. People's lives are at risk when things go wrong. So if the malware that we've identified is a threat, but it's not a current threat or it's not affecting operations, we hold up and we say, okay, the next uh, scheduled downtime is in two months. We're going to continue to monitor the threat, make sure it doesn't get out of control. But when we are allowed to take our systems down in two months, we're going to go through and eradicate that threat. But to get to that point is a very mature point. That has to understand architecture, has to understand your environment. You have to have network security monitoring teams that link back into that process to make sure the threat doesn't spread. Make sure there's not exfil leaving your network of your, your personal data or data that's important in the operations, et cetera. But that's that, that's that idea of moving beyond just the model and thinking about the purpose and the strategy of what you're trying to accomplish. And so instant response works really well in that environment when you link it into active defense and you're able to use the, the threat intelligence analyst, you're able to use the malware analyst, you're able to use network security monitoring. So again, this last piece of threat environment manipulation, what is this all about? Well, analyzing the threat and understanding how it affects your networks. One of the things that we often just don't do because we don't plug well into other teams, our team is the best team, it's the only team, there is no other team in the organization, right? That mindset that exists. Uh, we generally don't work well with IT. If you are a network security monitoring analyst, 
if you are a threat intelligence analyst, forget those sysadmins. You know, it creates rivalries. And in the private community, I see it, but in the government community, it is, it is most certainly true, where we have squadrons of people that have their patches, their coins, and how dare those other people, because this is the only squadron in the Air Force that exists. Um, the problem with that is if you really want to manipulate your environment, there's going to be somebody you got to go through, right? Sysadmin, IT, whoever. So if you're plugged into that process and you're thinking a little bit of strategy and learning from these lessons learned, what you're ultimately going to be able to do is affect your architecture, either logically or physically, to fight back that adversary, right? I'm not talking about putting beacons that's going into their network to tell you who they are. That's not the point. The point is saying, hey, you know what? This uh, piece of malware, it's only C2 servers in Iran. So we're going to go ahead and block those for a second, or actually, instead of blocking them, let's reroute them. Let's reroute them into our network through the DNS or the firewall, or whatever, sinkhole them, back to our analysis platform where we're going to analyze what they were trying to do. What were they trying to exfil? Oh, hey, actually, they were really interested in, you know, process data for our energy substation. Uh, why were they interested in that? Well, look at the capabilities and the infrastructure they were using. Who might this actually be? And that can form the process. And so these threat environment manipulation analysts are able to use the strengths of your own network to really try to impact defense, and that's important. And physically speaking, sometimes you can make physical changes. It's more rare. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's a little difficult to get approval to plug in switches in different places, but it can be helpful to have that, you know, nuclear option where you tell your leadership and get prior approval to say, if we come to a certain level and threshold of a threat, we're going to act differently. A great example and no good conversation that takes place with anything ICS or SCADA can get through an entire hour without talking about Stuxnet. So a good example of malware in the ICS community was Stuxnet, the piece of malware developed by somebody uh, that went through and uh, destroyed centrifuges at a specific facility in the Tanz, Iran. So, right, so a cyber capability that caused centrifuges to burst from their caskets and explode around a thousand of them. Nobody liked that on that side of the world, right? So with that capability, it jumped the air gap. It was an ability to move and manipulate and do all these things without the internet connection because Iran had done the very good security posture of having an air gap. They weren't letting Facebook, you know, route to their uh, internal traffic. They try to separate that. So what had to have happened is a lot of hard coding. Stuxnet as a malware had a lot of information and intelligence built into the malware where it knew what to do and what pointers to go to and what to ultimately accomplish without any interaction. So if you identify that in your network, you're doing some network security monitoring, you see that, uh, and ultimately you say, oh, look, I've interacted with this malware. I've determined that it's what it's trying to do. Actually, if I just move this over here, it's going to continue to poke over here and nothing's going to happen. So the type of physical architecture changes, which are difficult, and like I said, you need prior approval for physical architecture changes. Those ones can be extremely effective, especially against the threats that we've seen and the threats that can be extremely concerning. And ultimately, this feeds back into the cycle. So as you're going through and you're analyzing malware and threats and you're really learning from them, you're ultimately also getting things like indications of compromise, these IOCs. You're getting intelligence or really threat data about the threat and applying it to your area and saying, look, if I see this IP address, um, that might be an indicator that's malicious. Or if I have this digital hash on the network, that means that's a, you know that system's infected. So you pass it back to the threat intelligence consumption personnel. They're combining it with the outside intelligence, maybe through local ISACs or different people that are sharing information. And they're learning from their partners around the community and saying, look, um, here's our piece of the puzzle that we have about this campaign ongoing. What's your piece of the puzzle? And they come to a better decision about what's really going on, and they can force that back into the cycle. Now your network security monitoring analysts, again, are looking better places. They're learning about the threat in the environment. And truly, the, the point of all this is that now we're seeing a process develop, right? We're seeing a strategy. What's the ultimate strategy? It's not malware analysis. It's not installing the snort and shiny box on the, you know, the system. It's about actually doing defense in a meaningful way. And as you go through this cycle, there's a little bit of a knowledge management thing that happens. And so for management level positions, you've got to be aware that this is going to occur and you got to put it in the right format up front. You got to say, look, when you have your TTPs, your tactics, techniques, and procedures that you're learning from this threat, please, you know, structure it in this way store it in this secure database, whatever, and, and be able to maintain that knowledge about this process so that over time, not only are analysts getting better, but you're ultimately storing data that's important to so your learning. Now, uh, one of the other things about this in general is that sometimes we have an inability to communicate to leadership. Uh, General Welsh was famous. He's the uh, chief staff of the Air Force. He was famous for coming out at an air and space symposium 
and said, guys, gals, stop coming to me with this cyber talk. Okay, I don't understand what an IP address is. I don't care about your digital hash. Just stop it. Tell me how you relate to my mission. Tell me how what you do impacts what I do and how I can empower you to do it better. And so that's where we sometimes fail is we'll really get focused again on that process. So when you're taking more of a strategic view at it when you're really trying to learn, you've got to get plugged into these other teams and you're going to be becoming uh, more able to communicate in, in a common language in a way that people can also escalate up to leadership and management outside of all these tech terms and to saying, look, we're trying to do defense. It turns out we don't need that shiny box. We need that one or, or whatever it might be. But sometimes, and this has happened a lot in the government, especially our acquisition cycle, sometimes leadership really wants to empower you. So they'll buy you that $400,000 box and it does nothing that you want. And then you get told, well, I spent $400,000 on that. You're going to use it. Use it for something. And then it, and it just takes your time away from actually doing security in the first place. So as we go through and understand the needs of the entire active defense team and the people that are actually doing the analysis and work, we understand the needs of the organization better and what boxes to buy, but more importantly, what analysts to train. And that really plugs back to me for B-sides, is B-sides around the world, around the country is all about learning. I like B-sides because it's like 20 bucks a ticket, you roll in, and it's not about vendor talk, it's about meeting people around the industry and really understanding what their challenges are, what they're facing every day, what their lessons learned are, and we all learn from each other, and it's wonderful. And to me, when you have the, that learning that goes on, that training, that is far more powerful than any box you're going to put on the network. But again, once you have informed people uh, and people, you'll be able to uh, choose which boxes are important for you. So in conclusion, and yes, that means that I'm not going to run to the first time slot. You're welcome, next speaker. Uh, in conclusion, what I think generally goes on and needs to go on is a strategy. ACDC is something that I like. Mainly, I threw the cyber in there, so it is the acronym ACDC. Um, but what I like about it is it's a process, it's a strategy, it's something I can write on circles in a children's book background to management, they understand it, and then I can also take it to my security teams and I can go, you know what, this works, and we can implement it. It's something easy to communicate and effective to communicate. It, but it's not necessarily the right way. So I stand by it, I like it, I've seen it work in the intelligence community, I've seen it work in the government, I've seen it work in ICS and critical infrastructure. It may not be the right one for your organization. So whatever it is for your organization, you just got to figure it out, right? Whatever you come to, that's fine, but come to something. Think past that, hey, that firewall alert is the issue. Think past that, you know, whack-a-mole kind of strategy with defense and have a real strategy, not just this, you know, high-level model that gets briefed up in PowerPoint slides that says business strategy, but an actual strategy for what we're doing. And learn from your encounters with the adversary. Because ultimately, if we understand ourselves and the threat, we're going to counter it better. And uh, I would leave you with and open up to questions with, I, I truly believe that security is hard. I don't mean to make light of it. Nothing about security is easy. Whether it's personal interactions, national policies, uh, uh, actually doing the analysis, whatever it is, security is entirely difficult, and it, and it takes the best, most wonderful, passionate people around to do it. And that's why I love, the, love these conferences, why I love this industry, is because there are passionate people who I may roll up for the first time and say, you know what? I don't know anything about malware analysis. And Lenny Zeltzer, the guy who's like the malware analyst guru, Lenny will sit down with me and go, instead of saying, you know, oh, that's, that sucks, you're such a noob, like how could you not know this? He'll sit down and say, oh, that's cool, man. Here's some things to read. Let me get you started. When you come up to the level that I can help you, I'm going to help you out even more. And sit down and do that. And Lenny, for example, has done that. Rob Lee, the other guy in the stands that's uh, forensics, he's the guy that taught me a lot about forensics. He would sit down and do that. And that's what I love about this industry is when we put the egos at the door and move towards something good, security is, is maybe hard, but truly, I believe, defense is doable. Um, so with that, I'll also put up takeaway resources. I'll put these on the screen. Adrian's being wonderful enough to uh, record, so mostly you'll be able to grab them afterwards. To me, these are some books that if you want to think about what I was thinking with ACDC, here are some books that I've read that I enjoy that kind of match up. You'll see Boyd, the fighter pilot. Again, got to throw something to my Air Force guys. Uh, up at the top, you'll see the strategy of history by Lawrence Friedman, who, if you don't know his name, he is the, the uh, strategy guy the, over at King's College in London, where I'm doing my PhD. Um, we're doing it in war studies and policy, which isn't my security background. It's forcing me to think about different things. Uh, so Lawrence Friedman's that guy. Richard Baitlick, uh, he's a polarizing figure in the community to some, but I love him. He is just an awesome person. And uh, you know what? He, he's the guru on NSM. Uh, Jason Luker, Matthew Pope, Kevin Mandia. You've probably heard Kevin Mandia before if you're in this industry because he started Mandiant, which is the company that got bought out by FireEye for $1 billion, B, billion. 
Um, so he knows his stuff with instant response. So reading his book is probably pretty solid. Uh, psychology of intelligence ana analysis. If you're thinking about threat intel, you need to go back. Go back and start understanding intel. Understand the intelligence life cycle. Understand how to think critically. Analysis, competing hypotheses, these things. So this book is one way to get started on that. Um, for anything directly related to cyber threat intel, there is no book on it right now. I don't know who's going to write that book, but it's uh, it's kind of a, a new thing in the industry. But to me, there's this guy, Sergio and Chris, and, and they're over at uh, Active Response, and they're really good at this for a lot of reasons um, that I won't get into. But they have good articles, easily digestible, their own reading list, et cetera. And then uh, Little Bobby is actually my webcomic that takes place every week. There's not any way I get through without just plugging something. Um, but ultimately, I put it in there because you got to have a little bit of humor in this industry. You can't go through reading Lawrence Friedman's strategy of history and not ultimately want to read a comic book strip afterwards. So uh, even if it's not mine, keep a little keep a little humor going on. So with that, are there any questions? I'm gonna make this really easy. If not, no one's got even. What about? Let me ask it another way. Are there any critiques that anybody just says, "God, I hate you"? All right. Well, with that, uh, I end it. I very much appreciate your time, and I hope that B-Size, no matter what track you choose, is a wonderful time. I'm really excited, especially as an Alabama kid, to be able to come to B-Size in Huntsville. This is a great opportunity. I love Dianetics for setting it up, and Paul for being always too kind. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and have fun, guys. Yeah.